This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Science at the Theater, sponsored by the Friends of Berkeley Lab. My name is Jeff Miller, head of public affairs at the lab, and if not exactly your moderator for the evening, one of its many, many voices, as you will see. Uh, our topic this evening is technology, specifically the practical and inspiring technologies spinning out of Berkeley Lab that have particular pertinence to people in the developing world. A new institute at the lab, the Institute for Globally Transformative Technologies, I know a mouthful, um, also called LIGHT, is helping to identify and speed into existence a variety of simple, powerful, practical, and creative inventions aimed squarely at the root causes of global poverty. Now, one of the truths that we'll hear tonight is that 98% of the donated equipment is broken within five years, equipment donated in the developing world. So that you, you'll hear tonight uh, how Light is confronting that problem as well. It's not just about bringing things to the developing world, it's about the service model and a lot of other things in addition. So not surprisingly, this, we think this is Berkeley Lab at its very best. And on this stage tonight, you will meet a long cast of characters who were all playing a role in the race to save lives and improve the well-being of people everywhere. As always, we will follow tonight's program with a question and answer period. Uh, microphones are located here, here, and there are two upstairs as well. Uh, lastly, thanks to all of you who happened to go to the city uh, on October 22nd to the Herbst Theater. Here are two Nobelists, George Smoot and Saul Perlmutter, our most recent Nobelists, uh, discuss the fate of the universe with KQED's Michael Krasny. Uh, the video of that evening is available on our YouTube site, as is the video that we showed at the, uh, at the um, Herbst Theater event, uh, and that's called Looking to the Skies. This is the connection between the real, uh, the real connection between Maya astronomers and modern cosmologists. So it is now my pleasure to introduce the director of the lab's Environmental Energy Technologies Division, the man behind light, the Darfur stove, and the recipient of many national and international awards for his humanitarianism. Please welcome Berkeley Lab's Ashok Gadgil. Thanks, Jeff. So my job is to give you a bit of background uh, of how light came into being. It started with the director of the laboratory, Dr. Paul Elivisaros, asking me a couple of years ago, how is this going to go on? You have been doing work about disinfecting water for the poor people uh, in poor countries. You have invented a stove that, that helps women in Darfur. You now work on removing arsenic from drinking water in Bangladesh. But these are your own personal passions, and how is this going to get institutionalized? How, how is it going to get continuity in a way that is organized and that taps into enormous intellectual horsepower at a Lawrence Berkeley National Lab? So out of that thinking emerged LIGHT, uh, the LIGHT Institute. And I'm going to just give, as an example, the kind of work that I was doing at about the time that we were thinking about how light should be structured, how light should tap into this intellectual horsepower of the Berkeley Lab, and how we could go about making a change for the better for people who live on less than one or two dollars a day. So uh, as an exemplar, I'm going to walk you through uh, the, very quickly, the, the work on cook stoves for survivors of the conflict in Darfur. My name is Ashok Gadgil, and what we are starting with is a map of Darfur, uh, Sudan. Uh, the Darfur conflict started in 2003. 400,000 people, uh, mostly men, were killed. Uh, the estimates vary. It's hard to get an exact count. The lower estimate is maybe 300,000. Higher estimate is little over 400,000. Uh, there were 2.7 million refugees that were displaced 
mostly women and children because it was mostly the men who had been killed. Uh, and these 2.7 million people uh, had their houses burned down, villages devastated, lands taken away, uh, and then they streamed into camps for uh, internally displaced people. Uh, this is what the camp looked like when we visited that back in 2005. This is a photograph from Otash camp. Each of those little huts houses a family that originally lived in a multi-room house. They had their own land and a meager existence as a subsistence farmer, but maybe with their own flock of sheep uh, and, and some land which they had for generations. Now they lost everything. They got packed into these shelters. They were given food by the United Nations World Food Program, WFP, but not fuel. And they would leave the safety of the camps to women, would leave the safety of the camps to look for fuel wood outside the camps so that they could cook for their families. As you can imagine, you do this in the middle of the desert, very rapidly there is an expanding zone of complete denudation around the camps, and very soon there is no fuel wood within walking distance. This is what it looked like even in 2005. Now in North Darfur, which is even more desertified, there is no fuel within a day's walk for 80% of the people. Uh, people have resorted, women have resorted to selling their food rations uh, to exchange some of the cash for buying fuel wood from other middlemen. And it has led to starvation, uh, replacing the risk of gender violence um, and mutilation for the women as they leave the safety of the camps. We ended up, and here is, here is a group of women returning after seven hours walk, that is the average duration of a walk every other day. And sometimes they carry their babies on their back. You can't see it very clearly, but that's a seven hour trek for the baby hanging on the back of the mom because there is nothing else. Um, there's no relief there. So um, I was asked to figure out what to do about this. Can I do anything about this for a, by an officer from USAID? And at that time, I didn't have an answer. So it, it was a, a huge thing that, that hangs over your head. You all the time think about what can you do about something like this. It's so horrific. Uh, but I eventually discovered that these people cook on three stone fires. And you see a three stone fire here in the, in the picture. Uh, it's literally three stones supporting a pot and a fire is lighted underneath. It's the most primitive way to cook. It's also the least efficient way to cook. Between five and seven percent of the chemical energy in the wood is transferred as heat in the pot in this most primitive and most widespread way of cooking. But which also meant that maybe we could do something that allows them to keep their pots and their food and their culture and their way of cooking undisturbed, but figure out a way that allows them to cook with maybe half the fuel or one third of fuel. So that's what we started to do. Uh, in 2005, uh, they were using one dollar of fuel wood daily in terms of the traded value of the fuel wood. Uh, women were already selling food for firewood. This is what we were doing in 2005 December, comparing side by side different stoves in Darfur, three stone fires with number of stoves we took there because we didn't want to invent stoves. There were a lot of people who had done the stoves, so we just took some stoves which we thought would be useful. And our job would have been, hey, this is a stove that works. The USAID or aid organizations can buy them by the tens of thousands and distribute them. Uh, but that was not to be. None of the stoves we took were good enough. So we started finally designing stoves ourselves. This is a group of students, uh, graduate students at UC Berkeley. Uh, working in a class that I taught, but specifically addressing how to make a stove that works with Darfur pots. I brought back pots from Darfur with a, with a, with a little fan that you see in the foreground simulating desert wind at five miles per hour 
racing across the pot and you see a little anemometer there, a cup anemometer between the pot and a fan. And, and this stove, in presence of a breeze, uh, could actually use only one-fourth of the fuel that they would have used in a three-stone fire. Now, lab conditions are different in terms of field conditions. Uh, we, are, we had lab conditions at the Berkeley lab also testing for emissions of, uh, emissions of particulates, carbon monoxide, and measuring fuel efficiency in these stoves as we went along improving the stove. Here is a workshop uh, in Darfur building the stoves that we designed. We co-designed these stoves with Darfuri women and this is eventually the stove that is in production now is what we call version 14 or V14 of the stove. Uh, these are Darfuri refugees, the survivors among the men who have been trained by our engineers on assembling stoves using equipment that we sent from here and assembled it in and set up that assembly shop in El Fasher in North Darfur. And now they can build, essentially, this team of 12 people can build one stove every five minutes, as opposed to a mud stove, which they would do, a fuel-efficient mud stove, which wasn't that efficient to start with, which would take them three days to build one stove. And that's, that's the difference of doing science and engineering and technology and bring it to bear on something that is as basic as uh, cooking, but something that is as heart-rending as uh, women exposed to sexual violence. So these are the stoves built in that assembly shop. Uh, now, as we speak, we have more than 22,000 of these stoves in the hands of women in Darfur. We have 10,000 more flat kits, IKEA-style flat kits, which have been shipped and which are waiting in Port Sudan to clear customs. So in six months' time, they would also be assembled, and we would have 32,000 stoves in the hands of uh, women cooks in Darfur. Uh, the total number of stoves needed in Darfur is only 400,000, and we would have gotten close to 10% by end of next year. Uh, there is a nonprofit called Potential Energy. Uh, you just go to potentialenergy.org, and that's, that has lots more material about what has come out of the Berkeley Lab and is making a huge difference to the lives of women and girls in Darfur. So on the 8th of February uh, this year, at White House, there was an announcement that this kind of work is now being turned into a systematic, organized way to take our best minds in science and engineering technology to address problems at the bottom of the pyramid, to do the last mile of research that otherwise never gets funded because nobody votes for that kind of funding. Berkeley Lab said, we will take this on because it's important for the world. It's the right thing to do to provide a low carbon, high efficiency trajectory for the bottom two billion people to reach a standard of living that we consider essential for anybody in modern society. So that's what's announced uh, on the 8th of February. And with that, I would like to uh, invite the executive director of the Light Institute, Shashi Buduswar, to come and uh, lead the talk. Thank Thanks. you, Ashok. Thank you. So um, one story Ashok didn't tell you. Um, a couple of years back, I was in Sudan, in Darfur, uh, working with the UN peacekeeping mission there. And I heard this story, which I thought nothing of at the time. And uh, turned out there was a lot more to it than I thought. Um, apparently, there was this guy who had been going to these refugee camps, building these stoves, uh, which uh, people really needed, really wanted, and were very appreciative of. And one of them, uh, a family, ultimately went to this scientist and said, look, this is saving our lives. It saves us from walking seven hours. It saves us from horrible violence. Uh, we need this. We can't afford it. We don't know what else to give you. The only thing we have is the name of our child. So they asked Ashok's name, and they named their child after him. We spend so many billions of dollars and so much 
energy, trying to win hearts and minds. And I can't think of a more inspiring story of winning hearts and minds. And that was the genesis of the Light Institute. And what we'll do today is uh, explore a little more about what it is we're aspiring to do, how we're thinking of doing it, and we'll look at some examples. So let's get started with some statistics. And this will give us a sense of the magnitude of the problem. We're wrestling with the kinds of problems and set the context for where these things will work. Um, today, in 2012, there are 870 million people who will be chronically starving. They just will not have enough to eat. Often, they live on World Food Program aid. What is 870 million? That's one in eight people around the world. So if this room were full, there would be 75 people who simply, on a regular, routine basis, would not have enough to eat. Next, if you're a child, primary school age, there are many, many, many parts of the world where you either don't have the chance to go to school, or if you go to a school, the school systems are so broken that you might as well not go. 200 million children of primary school age. Just to put that in context, how many children is that? Well, you take all the children we have in the US of primary school age, multiply that by a factor of three. No education whatsoever. Then, Ashok talked about the refugee camps in Darfur. There are 25 million people in this year who live in refugee camps. And this is not poverty. This is well, this is, this is significantly worse than poverty. And how big is 25 million? If you take the 12 largest cities in the US, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston, and so on, and so on, um, add up their entire populations, they are all living in that in their homes are nothing more than tarp, often donated, often leaky, and they have no protection from uh, the elements and barely any security. And then there are infectious diseases that we all hear of, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and um, 16 million people by the end of this year will die because of, the, of these diseases. Often the medicines are there, and we'll see why it is so difficult for these medicines to reach these individuals. And to make matters worse, um, in large part because of things like climate change, if you think of drought and floods, these are really ravaging lots of places. Uh, over the last 10 years, there, are 100, there were 158 significant incidents of drought, 16 major droughts a year, and then floods, an order of magnitude worse, 17, uh, 1,750. That's, that's 175 floods every year. Now, we know, just from the last couple of weeks, that we can have major floods here. People get sick here. And a lot of people say school systems here aren't that great. So why is it such a big deal? Why is it that we worry about this in the context of developing countries? Well, it is because there is disproportionate impact on the populations of developing countries. So, Take the floods and the droughts I talked about. 98% of the people who suffer from this, and when I say suffer, they permanently lose their homes. Right? They die, they lose family members. Uh, think of how horrible um, Sandy was to the residents of New York and New Jersey. Um, it, as horrible as it was, most of the devastation was economic. We are able, we, are, we live in resilient places where we're able to withstand the effects of these types of incidents and are able to put our lives back together. Sometimes it's difficult, but we eventually get there. Um, so, why? There are, you know, here we have hospitals, we have doctors, we have technicians, we have institutions that reasonably function, we have roads, uh, infrastructure like telecommunications, and so on. Um, these things are missing. So if we think of what the big differences are between a developing or underdeveloped country and, and a country like the US, it is, number one, our, uh, more often than not, the governments are weak. The institutions are not very strong. There isn't necessarily rule of law. Uh, there, there isn't the environment to have policy, and even if policies are on the books, they're not necessarily enforced. Next, oops, sorry. 
um, infrastructure we talked about. So if you think of um, a farmer over here, it is very easy to grow something a thousand miles away and send it all the way to Berkeley. Uh, but what if there was no road whatsoever? You, how, how could you, if you're living uh, a thousand miles from the nearest city, what hope do you have of growing anything and selling it to anybody? Then the question, there's the question of technical talent, which is, um, I, I, I don't quote me on this, but one statistic I read is when Tanzania became independent, uh, the, the president, Julius Nyerere, the, uh, the founding father of Tanzania, he said he had a total of four civil engineers in, in the whole country. And the country was expected to build using four civil engineers. I might be off on that, but it, it was not any more significant than that. So um, now the question is, in the absence of this, what do we do? Over the last five decades of, of the aid work, we invested a lot in this. Billions and billions of dollars have gone into fixing institutions. We've, um, we've tried to educate. We've tried to build roads and dams. Uh, but, and we can still keep doing that. But what in the meantime? In the meantime, so let's say we, we start all over again. We invest in all these. It will take at least a generation. If we did everything perfectly, and Lord knows, things have been far from perfect in the aid industry. If we did everything perfectly, it would still take at least one generation of students to get educated, to learn what they need to, to become technicians, to become well-educated uh, legislators, and doctors, and engineers. Um, and if we then step back and think of you know, what, the, what a day in our life looks like compared to the day in life of a, of a poor farmer in, in uh, a typical country in sub-Saharan Africa, it is, you know, from the moment we get up, we have technology. We have alarm clocks, clean water, automobiles, um, um, air conditioners, flushing toilets, refrigerators. And there is so much we take for granted that simply does not exist. It almost, when you, when you go to some of these countries and you visit some of these communities, it really feels like they're living in a different century. What's worse is that if you think of R&D, research and development, every day something new gets announced that makes our, our life um, so much easier. And Lord knows, you know, every day. There are a thousand iPhone apps, which we don't need, but we get anyway. Um, but no one's doing R&D for developing countries. They certainly don't have the budgets. If they had the funding, they don't necessarily have the, the uh, scientists and engineers. And we're not doing anything significant for them. So that's where the idea of light came in. The Lawrence Berkeley Lab has 3,000 plus of the world's smartest, most accomplished scientists and engineers. 13 Nobel laureates in its, in the, in its history. And we do $800 million of research every year. Granted, not all of it is relevant to developing countries, so the Higgs boson, you know, as, as groundbreaking as it was, there's a lot of theoretical stuff that isn't necessarily relevant, but um, a significant portion of it is. And before I took on this job, um, I used to work as an advisor for various UN agencies and governments and NGOs and foundations. And I would get enormously frustrated, even depressed, at how ineffective that whole industry is. Um, sometimes it feels like the whole aid industry is an employment program for, for people living in, in uh, developed countries. And um, then uh, we got a call from the Berkeley Lab saying, hey, look, we've done this thing with, with the Darfur strobes. We did this thing with, uh, we, we'll hear about uh, an ultraviolet uh, UV water uh, purification system. But we'd like to really institutionalize this. We'd like to see if we can, what if we, this is, this is stuff that people like Ashok, out of literally the goodness of their heart, had been spending nights and weekends doing. This was not their day job. And the question on the table was, what if we actually created an institute? What if we worked with these 3,000 scientists and engineers and really used the muscle of the lab? What could be done with that? And um, we shopped this idea around. We spoke to well over 100 people in the, 
in the ecosystem. And the response was phenomenal. People, the, the word, the phrase game changing gets thrown around often. That was thrown around quite a bit in, the, in that conversation because um, everybody felt that things, for the most part, are done on the margins. We can, anyone can show up and hand out medicines. It's not that hard to go build a tent. But to really bring game changing technological breakthroughs is difficult. And what does that mean? So if you think of something as mundane and unpleasant as a toilet, right? um, we, what does it take to actually have a flushing toilet? It takes a sewer system. It takes water. And we flush our waste with drinking water. Most people in most developing countries, actually the water they drink is so much worse than the water we use to flush our waste. Um, there is no electricity, um, no infrastructure, and even if all those things were there, the populations don't necessarily have the financial, economic wherewithal to buy things. So what does a breakthrough look like? First of all, it has to work in the absence of electricity, reliable electricity anyway. Number two, it has to be hugely affordable. Number three, it has to be robust. And even if we do all of those things, uh, it's not like there's a Walmart that we can send these things to. Right? There is no mechanism for distributing these things. And so that's what we have to do to come up with breakthroughs. And so our model is, um, our motto is we identify, we discover, we develop, and we deploy scientific and technological breakthroughs for sustainable global development. And um, we'll, over the course of the evening, we'll see how this motto manifests itself in actual technologies. But it's, roughly speaking, got four parts to it. Number one, we have to know what we should be focusing on, because there are a thousand technologies out there which look very nice, but ultimately don't solve the problems. Um, more on this later. Then. Once we figure out what we want to do, we look in the lab, and I said $800 million buys you a lot of research. So we see what research has already been done. And recognizing that the research here is all for US-centric needs, for the most part, anyway, um, we have to figure out what research is almost done, and then just do the last mile of research. And think about the leverage this offers, because uh, we, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that Lovely box, it's a surprise, I won't tell you what it is, you'll find out soon. But, but we'll, we'll spend a, a few seconds talking about why we were able to develop that with as little money as we were able to. Um, so leverage, which is all this research has been done for, for purposes here, can you tweak a little way and apply that to solve these significant problems in other countries? Then um, once we do the core technology, chances are that uh, Product A in, a in one country will be used very differently from another country. It will be used very differently in a city versus a village. And it's very important to engineer and design these products so they're actually they're, they're serving the needs of the users. They're robust. They're, they're inexpensive. Um, and we also have to think about the, the repair infrastructure, right? So there's got to be, you know, if, if, let, let's say we come up with the perfect widget for something. What uses this if it breaks down in a year and no one's there to repair it? So we have to think about all of those things. And then finally, we have to figure out how to deploy this. Um, we all know by now that the old model of let's just give those poor people these technologies, let's donate them, that has failed over and over and over again. So we have to be very creative, very thoughtful in how we actually deploy these using business models that make sense for the particular context. So that's, our, that's how we're loosely thinking about, about uh, the Light Institute. And we've been around, so uh, we, despite these, the announcement was made in February, but we hit the ground, I think in April. So it's been about eight months we've been in business. And here's what we've done so far. First of all, there are a few interesting, really interesting technologies that we know are important and interesting. There's huge demand for. And we've, we have a small portfolio of, of those projects. And we'll, we'll see four examples of that today. Then we're stepping back and saying, what are the, what really matters? What are the most critical 
scientific and technological breakthroughs that are required for solving these problems. And um, once we do that, we'll have a good sense of what matters, what doesn't matter, where we should focus. So with that in mind, let me now uh, invite my colleagues, Zach Friedman and Lina Vashi, who will talk about the, the 50 most critical breakthroughs required for sustainable global development. So Shashi mentioned this idea of a breakthrough, which begs the question, of course, why are we so interested in these breakthroughs and what is a breakthrough? And the answer, at least for me, is there is tremendous power in these breakthroughs. Global development is, is extremely complex and there are many problems within development that technology is simply not applicable to. But there are many, many problems where technology is a key component of the solution. And oftentimes what we see within these problems is that when the right technology is developed, we can have a massive and rapid impact on people's lives. Prior to the mid-1950s, for example, hundreds of thousands of people around the world were affected by polio, which is a viral infection that infects the spinal cord, the brain stem. It can affect higher functioning within the brain, such as motor control. And this was pervasive, it was everywhere. The idea or the image of a child who needed an iron lung to breathe was something that was iconic. In the mid-1950s, we developed an oral stable vaccine that allowed us to take this disease that we couldn't even control in the US that was one of the wealthiest countries in the world and effectively eradicate it in many of the poorest places across the globe. Another potentially even more interesting technology comes from Asia, where again in the 50s and 60s, large parts of the continent we're facing massive starvation. It's, it, it's almost amazing to think about when today we think of Asia as this global growth engine. But for a long period of time, large parts of this region were actually dependent on food aid. That was solved in a large part to breakthroughs such as what we're looking at now, which is a semi-dwarf variety of rice, which essentially creates much more grain per seed and also has a shorter stock so that the stock itself doesn't bend over and break under the increased weight of the grain. It was breakthroughs such as this that enabled the Asian Green Revolution and essentially allowed the continent to double its food production in the course of just a couple decades, which is tremendous, essentially eliminating food security for a large portion of the population. Now, it's easy for us to look back and say, okay, this was a really important breakthrough or this was also a really important breakthrough. But as an institute, as light, we're forward facing. We want to know what we need to be investing in and we want to know what we tell our partners, oftentimes who are funders who are interested in funding this type of research. So for example, should someone be focusing on a low cost treadle pump that allows you to pull water from a river to spray on fields? Or should we be investing in development of drip irrigation technology so that we can more effectively spread the water across the fields? Should we be developing microbes that will help decompose fecal sludge in open sewers and urban slums? Or should we be developing a new generation of toilets that will prevent that fecal sludge from ever getting into the environment? Should we be developing personal or household water purification systems? Or should we be focusing on technologies that work at a community scale? For us as an institute, our focus is on having the greatest impact as possible, which means one thing, we're focused on the problems. And this, this might seem very straightforward, right? If you wanna solve something, you focus on understanding what that problem is. But it's not necessarily the nature of all scientific research. If you think about it, oftentimes the way that research institutions are set up, there are incentives for scientists to know a lot about broad areas, but really focus on individual areas, and that's where they push, and that's where you create science, and that's where you create these insights. The implication of this is really interesting because oftentimes when we find science and technology being applied to global development challenges, the solution was actually developed before the problem was really understood, or in often cases before the people developing that solution even understood that the problem existed. So this is something that we're very cognizant of at Light, and it's a paradigm that we refer to as hammers looking for nails. When you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and, and, and it's amusing, but it's also challenging because from our perspective, this is part of the reason why oftentimes technologies that are high potential never quite live up to their expectations. 
So instead, we go back to the problems. And for us, we've defined the problems in eight core areas with three themes that cut across each of these. And what we do is we essentially look at a single area and we unpack it and unpack it and unpack it and unpack it until we get down to individual addressable problems. And only then do we say, what is a technology that can solve this issue? So to illustrate a little bit of what this is like, let's look at one of the most important challenges facing the global health community today, which is maternal health. It has been said that the most dangerous thing an African woman can do is give birth. So what is the problem here? A thousand women die in childbirth every day. That means that by the time this presentation is over, 50 women will have died. One in 39 of all African women will die during pregnancy or childbirth. And most of these deaths are from causes that are treatable and avoidable. So how do we solve this? Solutions can be based on policy, behavior change, financial inclusion, and technology. For the purpose of sticking to Light's mission, let's focus on the technological interventions. So how can technology address the issue of maternal mortality? When talking to doctors, they'll highlight the need for antenatal care, the importance of getting mothers into clinics, as well as a host of technologies like the portable ultrasound, hemoglobin detectors for anemia, uh, uterotonics, sterile delivery kits, and blood pressure monitors. But with so many options and recommendations, where do we begin? It is essential to start with the problem. And if the goal is to reduce the number of maternal deaths, the obvious question, of course, is what exactly is causing these deaths? Well, here's our answer. While there's no single dominant cause of maternal mortality, postpartum hemorrhage is overwhelmingly more than one third accountable for maternal deaths. Let's take a closer look. Postpartum hemorrhaging, at a closer glance, is clearly a very complex issue with its own entire set of underlying causes. In this case, however, we do have a single dominant cause, which is uterine atony. Uterine atony occurs when the uterus fails to contract enough to reduce bleeding after the delivery of the baby in the placenta. While we don't know exactly why this happens, we do know how to prevent it and we do know how to treat it when it's happening. There's a procedure called active management of the third stage of labor. The third stage of labor is from the time of the birth of the baby to the delivery of the placenta. This is a method we use in the US to virtually eliminate all deaths due to maternal, all maternal mortality due to uterine atony. A key element of this is the use of a uterotonic. A uterotonic is a drug that causes the uterus to contract. In the US, we use synthetic oxytocin, which is extremely effective. Oxytocin is a naturally occurring hormone that the body releases towards the end of pregnancy in order to stimulate the uterus to contract, facilitate labor, and reduce bleeding. However, in the case that the body fails to, to release sufficient amounts of natural oxytocin, synthetic oxytocin can be easily administered to stimulate uteral contractions and reduce bleeding and prevent excessive bleeding or uterine atony. However, there's a catch. Synthetic oxytocin requires refrigeration, and as you may know, refrigeration is not a resource that's readily available in the developing world. As you may also know, the majority of women in the developing world do not give birth in hospitals or clinics, but rather at home. In fact, two-thirds of women give birth at home. Here we have a refugee home in a refugee camp where some of our colleagues have actually worked, and this could be a typical scenario for where a woman would give birth. So as you can see, there's no, there's no option for electricity or refrigeration, thus making synthetic oxytocin not exactly a realistic option for the majority of women in the developing world. So what is it that we need? What we need is a thermostable uterotonic that can be administered easily with, little to minim with minimum to no training. This uterotonic could be a stable version of oxytocin or another uterotonic drug. Misoprostol is a, is a currently existing drug that's a viable option to be used as a uterotonic. However, it's controversial because it can also be used for medical abortions, and thus in some countries faces, faces substantial political opposition. So at the current moment, the best bet for combating maternal mortality is another stable uterotonic that can uh, stimulate the uterus to contract and prevent postpartum hemorrhaging and uterine atony. This, to us, is a critical breakthrough for global development, and this is how we go about approaching our, our, in, our analysis and identifying critical breakthrough technologies. So if, if a stable uterotonic is what 
comes out of this analysis. If looking at what causes mortality and what are the subconditions and what are the issues that then drive that has led us to this one technology. The question is what about all of these other things that have come up? So a portable ultrasound is an interesting technology, but it doesn't necessarily address any of the major issues that we identified earlier, such as postpartum hemorrhaging or hypertensive diseases. It does have an interesting property in that it helps bring women into clinics, but from our perspective, that's not enough to make this one of the most critical technologies that needs to be focused on. Blood pressure measurement devices are a little more challenging. Understanding a mother's blood pressure is a key component to diagnosing and then treating for hypertensive diseases. But there are two problems with just looking at a blood pressure measurement device on its own. The first is that it's strongly dependent on strong antenatal care, which as we know is not available and not, um, not available within the systems in most developing countries. The second is that hypertensive diseases are actually incredibly challenging to treat. Even in the US, the definitive treatment for mothers with extremely high blood pressure is to deliver the child. If our basic care here is so dependent on delivering a child, even if it's premature, to save the mother's life, you can imagine that there's very minimal options for mothers in emerging markets where they simply don't have access to the same type of health care. Sterile delivery kits are not as important in our perspective. Yes, it is important to have clean kits, but as we saw at the beginning, infections only account for about 8% of maternal mortalities. We do see this come up again when we look at neonatal mortality, where clean delivery kits are an important reason to prevent infections. But if you're thinking about maternal mortality specifically, delivery kits are just not as important. The last and potentially most challenging point is looking at hemoglobin detectors, which test for anemia. And this, similar to a blood pressure measurement device, is really most effective when there's strong antenatal care, which we know there isn't. What's even more challenging is it's uh, complicated to understand the link between anemia and hemorrhaging. When most, uh, most maternal mortality that's due to hemorrhaging, the actual cause of death is blood loss, as opposed to deprivation of oxygen, which anemia contributes to. And so it's unclear that even if you treated mothers for anemia, if it would actually improve the outcomes for mothers who hemorrhage. From our perspective, if you look specifically at saving mothers' lives, there's one clear technological breakthrough that stands head and shoulders above the others in terms of the impact that it can have, and it is a stable uterotonic. So this is something that we do repeatedly. It's a complex way to analyze a problem, and it's somewhat time consuming, and sometimes it's frustrating because you have a huge set of problems, and you come up with maybe one or two technologies that really seem high potential. But at the same time, it's rec replicable. And fortunately, with the help of a large number of experts, we're going through this list on, a bi uh, on an individual basis, breaking each issue out, understanding what underlies it, understanding what contributes to it. We're about a quarter of the way through now, and we hope to be done by July. So if we're lucky enough to be here again, hopefully we'll have much more to discuss with you. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Um, so the, the reason we're doing this is we could simply go ask people, ask experts, what do you think the most important breakthroughs are? And what we found is that the, you know, the answers are not often correct because you know, there's always this, this, this syndrome that Zach talked about, which is a lot of experts like their own hammers. And so it's really important for us to push the boundary in terms of, well, let's step back and really unpack and unpack and unpack. And it's okay to cross out some sacred cows. Um, and uh, without doubt, uh, some of our findings are not popular. But what we're finding is that no one's actually done this kind of analysis before. And so once they see the fact base, once they see the analysis, and the logic, what we're finding is that a lot of the experts are coming around. And what we're hoping to do with this is two things. First of all, as Zach mentioned, the, the general level of understanding of this, this question, which is what are the most important breakthroughs, is actually not very high. And so part of this, it will, we, we'll, uh, one objective is to use this to to coalesce and catalyze the ecosystem. So the number of organizations like USAID who are really interested in this because they want to use this to shape how they fund. Um, and, and so what we'll do with this is 
an annual, so once we identify the 50 breakthroughs, we'll have an annual state of the breakthrough um, event where we say, what have we learned? Have we developed anything new? What are the technical challenges we have overcome and need to overcome next time around? And once we solve a technology problem, how do we think about the deployment? What have we learned there as well? So um, we're finding that there's a lot of excitement and a lot of interest in this particular exercise. And then what does it mean for us? So once we identify the, the, the 50 breakthroughs, you think of a timeline. Some of the stuff can be done ne by next year. Some of the stuff is 10 years out. And so these, so if you think of these 50 bubbles representing these breakthroughs, they'll be stretched all along that timeline. And let's say you draw a line in the middle, five years. Uh, frankly, if something is a year out, chances are someone else is gonna do it. We don't need to do it. We don't need to, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to use, it's, it's an overkill to, to use uh, a national lab's uh, capacity to do, to do that. So we're focusing on the stuff almost at the other end of the spectrum, which is if something is really, really important, will save a lot of lives, but is 10 years out, can we accelerate that? Can we make that happen in two years? Frankly, nobody, they, you know, I've as I said I've, I've served in, uh, in my old jobs, I've served institutions all over the world. I very strongly believe that the Lawrence Berkeley Lab is, is the single largest repository of R&D to solve these problems and to accelerate these breakthroughs. Um, um, what I'll do now is I'll go pick up that box, bring it to you and tell you what it is, and then introduce our, my, my, my colleagues. Um, feel free to guess what this is. Oh my gosh, great guess. So this, my friends, is the world's first portable solar-powered vaccine refrigerator. And to tell you why it's important and how it works, uh, Jonathan Slack and Reshma Singh. Okay, so before we start, I want to acknowledge one member of our team who's not up here with us, and that's Howdy Gowdy, who um, is a very essential uh, design designer and heat transfer expert who made great contributions to this. And um, there will be a moment when, I have to put this back. <laughs> okay, so we're queued up here. All right, contrary to what most of us would think, this was not the idea of the FBI. This was first published in the Washington Daily News on February 7th, 1949, and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was hesitant to allow this to happen, but he decided to take the risk at the urging of these two editors of the paper. And within a year, three of these men were apprehended based on tips from the public. And after that, he was a convert. And uh, starting on March 15th, 1950, he began publish publishing directly himself. So what these people have in common, what they still have in common if they make it onto this list, is that there's no ambiguity about the threat they pose to society. If you see one of these people, it's clear that you need to take action today, not tomorrow. These are some of the world's and humanity's most feared and most persistent pathogens. We have polio, tuberculosis, rubella, measles, diphtheria, tetanus, mumps, pertussis, yellow fever. This last one's the hantavirus. And what vaccination does is to give our immune systems an early warning, a heads up. The message is, if you run into one of these, if you see one of these, do not be polite. <laughs> do not make small talk. Do not pause for even a moment. This is the moment to mount a defense, to take every resource you have and to do it in the biggest way possible and to do it immediately. We've come to take for granted our very effective immun immunization programs. Okay, we take our kids to the doctors when they're little. We take them every every few months, and they get a whole bunch of shots. And by the time they're five years old, we pretty much 
have passed the point of anxiety about the health of our children. So this got me curious. I called up the Berkeley Department of Public Health, and I was fortunate enough to, fortunate enough to reach Dr. Jose Duco, Ducos, and he invited me down. We went through his old record books. He didn't even, he had actually, at the, as a result of this call, he discovered some books that he hadn't actually found before. And up here you can see, this is Berkeley, California, all right? And what we discovered was that back in the 30s, and this was when Ernest Orlando Lawrence, who founded Berkeley Lab, was working on his first cyclotron. This was before he got his Nobel Prize in physics in 1939 for that cyclotron. At that time, the beginning of summer, which most of us think of as like really exciting time, especially if you have kids, they get out of school. The beginning of summer had an edge of terror to it that we can't imagine today. In June of 1933, 42 people in Berkeley came down with polio. 812 people had pertussis. That was one out of 100 people in the city of Berkeley, which had a population of 82,000 at that time. And um, most of these were kids, and for the kids, it would be a life-threatening illness. But in many parts of the developing world, that kind of burden on the community and that kind of suffering of people who still get these diseases, it's, it persists. And Reshma is going to tell you about that. Well, the 1930s may have come and gone in Berkeley, but it still persists in many parts of the world. In fact, in my, on my last visit to India, I, I wasn't really surprised to see many centuries living together. I saw a Mercedes-Benz and a Bullock cart parked at the same traffic light. <laughs> this is the kind of things that happen. There's a stark contrast between the, develop, the developing world and the industrialized world. In fact, this contrast is even more stark when you look at the urban-rural divide. The people in remote areas especially in, the, in rural areas in many parts of the world, don't have access to infrastructure, to electricity, to transport, to medical services, to education services. Some of these remote places are really the most pristine natural landscapes ever known to man. I mean, think of the hot sand dunes of the Sahara, or think of the upper reaches of the Himalayas, which are freezing cold. Yes, they're beautiful, but do services reach them? No. Meet Lara. <clears throat> She grew up outside of Biera, Mozambique. She's a very bright child. In fact, she was the hope of the future for the village. Her parents took extremely good care of her. They skimped and they saved and they sent her to school. They gave her all the vaccinations that she was supposed to have. She was the first child in the village to go to college in Biera. When she was in college, one day she developed fever and muscular paralysis and she was diagnosed with paralytical polio. Why did this happen? She already got the vaccines. Well, Lara's parents vividly remember the day when Lara was three, about three years old and they took her to the clinic. It was actually a makeshift mobile clinic under a tree in Biera. Her mother had actually taken with great difficulty, she'd taken time off from work. They waited for the healthcare worker to come. He did arrive on his bicycle with an ice box with the, with the polio vials uh, in his ice box. Lara at three get, did get the vaccine. She got the booster doses as well. So then why did this happen? Why did she get polio? Well, in retrospect, they realized that it was a very hot, dusty day that day in Biera. Either the polio vial got overheated because of the ambient heat or it got frozen sitting next to the ice in the ice box that the healthcare worker had provided. And because of either this overheating or overcooling, the vaccine lost its potency. And despite all of the efforts of the government, the healthcare workers, the parents, the children, everybody in the chain, this still led to a devastating effect. She did still get polio. When we work with our partners in field and other NGOs and institutions like the Clinton Health Initiative, with PATH, with Gates, we realize that these kind of stories are very common all over the developing world. In fact, there's a few different patterns that are emerging. One is where the healthcare worker tries to enlist parents to come to the vaccine uh, campaigns, which happen either monthly or weekly. The problem is that surveys have revealed that 
Parents, even though they come to the vaccine campaigns, often find that there's unavailability of vaccines, and this is mostly because the vaccines have not been kept in a thermally safe environment, so they don't come back again. The other pattern that's emerging is that the healthcare worker will trek for miles with his ice or her ice box, find babies out in the village or in the forest. You can see this gentleman is helping a woman put a load of firewood down and inoculate the baby. This is the kind of ice box that he carries. And then the baby's vaccination is tracked by putting a little marker on his nail. And that's the kind of tracking that you have. This is the use case scenario which actually shows how the vaccines are taking the journey from the manufacturer all the way to the end, end of chain. So let's just look through the journey of a small vial of polio costing about 11 cents and it takes about 11 months of journey to go from the national level storage depot through the, div through the state, through the division, through the uh, public um, health outpost and then add to it some more months before it reaches the final end of chain. Now throughout the end, throughout the life cycle of this vial, before it gets vaccinated, before it gets inoculated into a baby, it must retain a very narrow temperature range of between two to eight degrees centigrade. And this is called the vaccine cold chain. And because of these kind of transportation and this kind of end use scenarios, we have to very carefully figure out what it is that will take the vaccine all the way from lab to jab. <laughs> So the WHO actually substantiates um, this kind of user case scenarios. In fact, with all the money being thrown at the vaccine problem, billions of dollars being spent on development and deployment, all the charity that's going into it, it is not the money which is the issue. It's actually the vaccine cold chain which is a major issue. 44%, almost half of the issue arising, the biggest barrier to dissemination of the vaccine program is the immunization system and basically the cold chain. So the light vaccine team at the lab decided to look at the critical specifications required for end for the last mile where you could actually take a portable, robust, lightweight vaccine refrigerator and make sure that the thermal stability remains constant. And this was a challenge the light vaccine team took, uh, took upon and Jonathan will walk you through that. So I'll take a few minutes to tell you about a little bit about our design process. What you see here in this image, this is um, Howdy and me at our brainstorming old fashioned chalkboard. So the design process started out with some really easy to grapple, to grasp parameters. We knew we had this two to eight degree temperature range that we had to stay within, okay? We knew that the regions of the world that we wanted to be able to make a difference in tended to be very hot. And the WHO, the World Health Organization, has this um, climate zone called hot climates. And the presumption for any type of device that is going to operate there is that the ambient temperature is going to be 43 degrees C, that's 109 degrees Fahrenheit, day and night, all the time. Okay, and that's a quite a challenging environment to try to keep things cool or cold inside of. So we had that information. And what we needed to do, and this is kind of unique to the light projects, um, you'll see in a later picture that um, many of us also work on more traditional scientific projects. And this project requires the um, ability to gather information from much more distant points, not just points of the world, but over a much broader spectrum of uh, considerations. I mean, there's sociological considerations. It's a much more complex process. And in the process of trying to gather information, it became apparent that we didn't know what exactly we were going to come upon in terms of what would work best. It, it was, as you looked at those pictures, you see sometimes people are transporting these uh, vaccines on their bicycles. Sometimes they're walking with a little cooler down little paths, you know, um, long distances for a day or two. Sometimes they have a vehicle. So it wasn't clear if we needed a small volume or a larger volume or a really large volume. One of our ambitions, and this is something that isn't done currently, was to make it possible for end of cold chain clinics, like very close to the very, very end of the whole system, the most remote places, to be able to keep the vaccines for weeks on end. So we decided that we wanted our vaccine cooler to not just be a transport system, but we wanted it to also 
be able to store the vaccines at the end of the cold chain. And we wanted to be able to do it with no grid power, all right, because at these locations, you're not going to have grid power, and if you do have it, it's gonna be very intermittent. And to do, so that meant that we had to source our own power. Solar power was the most logical thing. We had to think of a, a cooling system, because we need active cooling now, and we need to be able to maintain this system for days at a time when there's no sun, or you might have to travel for two or three or four days to get there, all right? The World Health Organization requires a three-day holdover time. That means that you can go without power. Um, they actually allow you like five or 10% of solar ambient, which isn't enough to do very much with. So I just consider it without power um, for three days. But we realized that we needed to go longer than that. So we set our design goal to be able to go for five days with no power. And then we wanted to be able to run on a single, fairly large, you know, the, the newer type of solar panels is about 1.2 square meters. Um, we wanted to be able to run on that amount of power and we had to not only store the energy that would be used to keep the vaccines cooled overnight, but we had to store enough energy so that they would be able to go for a few more days without sun when that, when that occurred. Okay, so we had all these design considerations and we tried to wrap them all into to a product. And what became apparent is that we really needed to be thinking in terms of a family of products. We needed to be thinking of a way that the vaccines could be moved from one system to another and um, carried by somebody in a backpack in some situations, carried by somebody in a bicycle in another situation. And what this led us to was a modular design. We wanted a system that could be one size for individual product, but that the core of it, the, the actual um, cooling system could be scaled up or down to meet these different needs. And the thing that I feel most enthusiastic about is the fact that I think we've succeeded at coming up with this modular design. It's modular also in terms of how the vaccines are handled. There's one last thing I wanted to add about this, which is that one of the great things about working on these projects is that almost everybody you run into along the way, because you're always asking for help or you're asking for resources, there's a wellspring of goodwill that comes up when they find out what the project actually is. And um, so in this case, for example, all the guys in the main shops, this is Steve Ferreira, that's Marty Martinez's arm up there. Um, these guys were booked through the end of the year. They didn't have any time left. but. They all figured out a way to make the time to help us out to make some of these components for us. Do you want me to do it for you? Or you can do it, okay. So as Jonathan mentioned that the light team really responded to the call for action, um, <laughs> literally. So this is one of the vaccine campaigns um, out um, in Africa. Um, so one thing that we did realize is that every country has a different cold chain and we have to work very closely with the ministries of health to make sure that we're able to tailor our solutions. So the idea that we've always been told by the ministries of health is do not give us a product, don't give us dysfunctional stuff. We have storehouses full of solutions or products which haven't worked. The ministries also realize and the world realizes that you can save deaths from happening, you can over the next 10 years be able to almost decrease the illness of about 500 million people. In fact, scaling up vaccines by 90% is gonna enable $300 million of healthcare costs being saved and up to $17 billion of productivity increases. However, for us at Light, the main thing is to be able to put a smile on these children's faces and to enable healthy, happy, productive communities and countries, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so two very quick things. Uh, I mentioned that um, over the last decade, a lot of millions and millions of dollars had been spent on, on this problem. And it took our scientists um, $45,000 in three months to solve this. It goes to demonstrate the power of this. So next, I'll invite my colleague, uh, Susan Addy, to talk about a host of things she's doing on one of the most precious things on our planet, which is water. Yeah. so I'm gonna to try to talk a little fast and cut it a little bit short. Um, oops, I'll start by going the right direction. Uh, so we know in 2012, around 900 million people don't have access to what's called an improved water source. That basically means they're drinking their water directly from rivers and streams untreated. Now, this wouldn't be such a problem, except that another two and a half billion people don't have access to sanitation. It's about a third of the planet. 
or yeah, a third of the planet. Now, if you don't have any access to sanitation, you're stuck going in open sewers or fields or the same rivers, lakes, and streams where you get your drinking water. In fact, to understand what the meaning of sanitation is, you can think of it as what it is, which is any barrier between your poop and your drinking water. Now, that's a pretty important barrier, right? A third of the planet doesn't have that, so you can imagine what happens. Now, this doesn't just make us queasy, it's also really bad for health, because there are all kinds of pathogens that reproduce in the human gut, and those also come out in feces. Things like the bacteria that causes cholera, or various kinds of viruses and protists that lead to severe diarrhea, or even all kinds of parasitic worms that cause malnutrition and stunting. Now, these come out in the water when you don't have that barrier. You also don't have a barrier between these and your drinking water. This is mostly felt by children, children under five. Every year, around 2.2 million children die of diseases that could be completely prevented with adequate water and sanitation. It's about 6,000 a day. So in the last 24 hours, the number of children who died of these preventable diseases could fill 12 theaters the size of this one. It's quite a lot. Now, keep in mind we're making a lot of gains. Two decades ago, it would have taken 27 theaters to hold the number of children. So some things are being done. It's a good statistic, right? You've been hearing all these bad statistics. You can hear that some things are being done. But the number is still too high. And things are failing too quickly to really make a difference. So this leads to the question of why. Why are things failing? Why is it that in 2012 we can put somebody on the moon many years ago, but we can't solve water and sanitation for a third of the planet? Now this is a question that's really interesting to me, and it's a really important question to answer. It turns out that a lot of really talented and smart people have tried to solve this problem. And they've come up with a lot of really innovative solutions, but those solutions are failing too fast to make a difference. For example, these are all decentralized water treatment systems that I've come across in India. Every single one of them works really well in a lab, and every single one of them appears to be very appropriate for the environment in which it's in. Every single one of them was defunct in less than a year. Now, I didn't try to find defunct systems. I literally couldn't find one that was working. Now, there are some that work, I'm told. I am sure that it exists, but I haven't found any. So why are these all failing? Well, let's look at a couple of just quick examples. This is a filter system that was put in by a government. It was given to the village for free, and the government hired as part of the implementation somebody to come around every six months and change the filter media. The community used the filter, six months went by, the filter clogged, nobody came around. Now they're not paying this person's salary, so they don't have any way to hold this person accountable. They don't have any way to contact the government who is paying this person's salary. So the filter goes defunct and they end up abandoning it, going back to their previous water sources. This is a pond sand filter. It was donated by a nonprofit organization, free of cost to the community, and this time they trained someone in the community to do the training, or sorry, to do the maintenance for it so that they wouldn't have to rely on someone outside of the community. That worked great for about eight months, and then something broke that that person couldn't fix. They didn't have anybody to call, they didn't have the internet, so the thing went defunct, and they went back to their other water sources. This is a dug well. It was donated for free to the community by a nonprofit organization. It was working really well for a while, but then somebody decided they needed a part that was in part of the pump, and that part kind of walked away. Now, the people who were still using it didn't, didn't have the money to replace this part, and they didn't really have the incentive to replace it because they didn't really like the taste of the water, so they ended up abandoning it. You can see a common theme here. Right? The technologies themselves are not failing. The technologies themselves work in theory. What's failing is the system for maintenance, the system that's put in place to replace a part when it goes bad, uh, to replace it when it goes missing, to keep it from disappearing in the first place, to do routine maintenance. These things don't exist. And that's what's happening to all of these filters. So we decided to think about things a little bit differently. We decided to look at the system of supporting the technology as being as important or even more important than the technology itself. So imagine you live in a village, and imagine that instead of a donated community system, I built for you a clean water store. Now you don't have to do any maintenance, you don't have to use it if you don't want, but anytime you want clean water, you can go there and pay for it at a price you can afford. Even though you make less than a dollar a day, you can afford the price. The government owns the infrastructure, the local government, the government that you elected and that you might know personally, a private company runs the system. Now, you don't know the private company, but they have access to global supply chains, they have access to professional quality control, and most importantly, they don't get paid unless they produce clean water that you're willing to pay for. So there's some accountability there. This is the model of something called Water Health International. 
And this is a picture of one of their centers. And they sell clean water for about two cents per 10 liters, which you can afford if you're making less than a dollar a day. And they deliver it to your door for four cents per 10 liters, because people don't like to carry water. If you've ever carried water, you know that this is very, very true. Now, they operated, uh, they started a few years ago. In January, they opened their 500th center, and they now claim five million customers per year, per day. Sorry, five million customers per day. Now, at a number like five million, you can start to make a dent in that one billion people without access to clean water that I mentioned earlier. You can't make a dent with donated systems that are failing, 80% failing within a year. So this is something that's working. Now, I haven't told you the whole story, though because I've told you about the model, and even though I've made a case for why the model is incredibly important, you can't do this model without the right technology, right? You can't make this work unless you have a technology that operates so cheaply that you can sell it at a locally affordable price and still pay for the maintenance, and still fix it when it breaks, and still make a nice building, and still pay for quality control, and all of these other things, right? Uh, so that technology didn't exist in the mid-90s. And that's when Ashok Gadgil, who you saw speaking earlier about the Darfur stove, started working on this in nights and weekends. And what he came up with was this. It's called UV Waterworks. I was supposed to have a demo here. That's my fault, I'm sorry. Um, but it looks like that. <laughs> and, uh, what UV Waterworks does is it takes UV light and it cripples the DNA in living things so that they can't reproduce. It's very energy efficient. It's very cost effective. It's very effective in the sense that it meets international standards and kills all the pathogens. And it's very elegant because you don't have to add any chemicals to the water and you don't have to add a, a filter that might clog. It's also very cheap. It costs about five cents a ton or 0 0.005 cents per liter. That's about 25,000 times less than the last bottle of water you probably bought. And it's about 6,000 times less than the bottle of water that would be for sale in a developing country. So now you've got something that will work in this model. Now you've got something that you can provide water that you can sell at a locally affordable price. If you can't sell it at a locally affordable price, you're not providing access, right? It, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Um, so this was a big breakthrough. It's not something you would normally think of as an appropriate technology for developing countries, right? It doesn't look like the Dugwell, which looked much more appropriate in your mind. But this has reached orders of magnitude more people than the Dugwell because this is partnered with a sustainable delivery system. They go hand in hand. The model doesn't work without the technology, and the technology doesn't matter without the model. So there's this pairing there. Now, when this was successful, we wanted to apply it to some other problems, namely arsenic and groundwater. It turns out that in a lot of developing countries, especially Bangladesh and West Bengal, they don't get water out of rivers and streams. They use hand pump tube wells like this, and they collect groundwater. Now, in many areas of the world, there are natural deposits of arsenic in the groundwater. This is the same arsenic you've heard of as a poison. It's the same thing that's in rat poison. And the reason it's a famous poison is because it's colorless, tasteless, and odorless. So right now, around 60 million people in Bangladesh and West Bengal are drinking water that has a poison they can't see or detect in any way. It's been called the largest mass poisoning in human history. And it's been going on for about 20 years. Now, when you drink small amounts of arsenic for a little while, um, you start to get lesions on your hands and feet. And those lesions can crack and form gangrene, which can lead to amputations, which in these areas tends to be a little bit ad hoc, so they have a high level of complications. Eventually, you can get internal cancers, which you can't detect because you don't have any of the modern detection systems that we have here. So that leads to a high level of fatalities. So this is a very insidious poison. It's an insidious problem that builds up over years. This is literally an invisible thing. Nobody can see it. Um, we want to use a similar model to water health, but we want to make one key change. We want to partner with schools. The reason for this is because schools are a center of education, and education is going to be key for this problem. This isn't replacing river water with clean water that also tastes better. This is replacing clear, tasty water that you get in your backyard for priced clear water that you pay for 10 blocks away, right? Or get delivered to your house for a fee. So we have to inform people, people have to understand the importance of it to create value. And they should be able to decide if it has value for them or not. But school is a good way to teach what we know about arsenic and why it's important to use different methods. But again, just like with the UV Waterworks, this model isn't going to work unless we have the technology to go with it. UV Waterworks doesn't work because it kills living things and arsenic isn't living. So we're going with something called electrochemical arsenic remediation, or ECAR. ECAR is based on the fact that if you put steel in water, it rusts. 
If you put two pieces of steel in water and you run a little current through it, it rusts a lot and it rusts really fast. It turns out that rust likes to absorb arsenic and rust likes to gather other pieces of rust together and make big pieces of rust. So we put a lot of rust in the water. It mops up all the arsenic and grows into a big particle. When the particle is big enough, it sinks to the bottom and we can take the arsenic free water off the top. It's a very nice, elegant solution. It also costs a fraction of a cent per liter to operate. It's very low maintenance. It's very robust. And the supply chain is literally mild steel that you can get anywhere plus a little bit of electricity, which you can get from a solar panel or a battery. So it works really well. We've been developing it for about six years. This is a 600 liter prototype that just a few weeks ago we installed in this school outside of Kolkata. And I'm going to be visiting it in about a week and it's got excellent initial results. It's producing water that's maybe 60 times the World Health Organization safe limit to water that's below the safe limit. And we're gonna run it for a few months and see how it goes. And you can follow it on our website, which is gadgillab.berkeley.edu. I don't know if they're gonna get that later, but we'll get it to you or you can find me afterwards. Now, the next problem that we wanna tackle is brackish water. Brackish water is water that is not as salty as seawater, but it's too salty to drink. It tends to occur in areas where fresh water meets salt water and in some kinds of groundwater. And it's gonna become much more important as we continue to deplete our fresh groundwater resources and as sea level rises and salt water intrudes into the groundwater resources we have. In fact, it's gonna become really essential that we be able to treat brackish water and use those water resources. We've come up with a concept called capacitive deionization. It's in the conceptual stage, and we're working on the same kind of model that you've been seeing throughout, building a technology that can operate so cheaply and robustly and low maintenance that it fits inside a sustainable delivery model. And I'm gonna stop there because we're a little short on time. So thank you very much. Thanks, Susan. So you can imagine the value of desalination, taking all this water that's not quite as salty as seawater, but still too salty for, for consumption, and making that, um, making that potable and usable. Our last uh, technology we'll, we'll discuss today is um, uh, with the problem of tuberculosis, TB. And for that, I have Aditya Katamanchi. <laughs> All right, so thank you all for coming and for paying attention for uh, us going over time. So today I'm gonna to talk about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a very old disease. In fact, it's been, up, been with us ever since humans have been on this earth. It's a disease that affects the lungs. It's caused by a bacteria. And people who develop tuber tuberculosis usually present with several weeks or months of cough, fever, weight loss, and night sweats. As the disease, disease progresses, it starts to destroy the lungs. So patients often develop uh, they often cough up blood, and it's quite dramatic. Patients also lose weight profoundly, and the disease was actually called consumption for a long time because people sort of just waste away. The paintings shown here are actually were done in the 1800s. The one on top is by Edvard Munch, and it depicts his, dis his sister who died of TB. And the one on bottom is by Claude Monet, who shows his wife dying of TB. At the time these paintings were done in the 1800s, one out of every four people in Europe who died, died of TB, right? And that's pretty astounding. So fortunately today, TB is much less common, especially here in the US and other parts of the developed world. But it still remains an important disease in much of the developing world. The areas shown in dark blue on the map on top are the areas where TB is really common. And the map on bottom here sort of blows up those countries based on the, the size of the countries is based on their TB prevalence. And you can see that TB disproportionately affects poorer parts of the world. Last year, there were about 12 million cases of TB worldwide and 80% of those were in Africa and in Southeast Asia and in countries like India and China. There were about one million deaths from TB worldwide, and again, 80 to 90% of those were in Sub-Saharan Africa. Another reason we should care about TB is really that TB, even though it's not common here in the US, TB anywhere is TB everywhere. And by that, what I mean is TB is spread when a person with the disease coughs and spreads infectious aerosols into the air. These aerosols can remain suspended for long periods of time, and when they're inhaled by other people, those people can then become infected with TB and develop the disease. So this can happen almost anywhere. It can happen to any of us. It can happen on a bus, on other forms of public transportation, in a crowded market, or even in a routine office building. Another reason that we remain concerned about TB, even here in the US, is that is a growing problem of drug resistance. 
In 2000, there were 10,000 cases of drug-resistant TB reported worldwide. But just 10 years later, that number increased to 650,000 cases. Drug-resistant TB is very difficult to treat, often taking two years of treatment with injections with very toxic and expensive medications. It's even been described by the US intelligence community as a national security threat because we really don't have any medicines to treat it. So preventing the spread of drug resistance is a key global health priority. The best way to prevent the spread of TB is to diagnose it early and then to start effective treatment. The picture here is, is of Edward Koch, the scientist who first saw TB under a microscope in the mid-1800s. And then fast forward 150 years later. And today, this is still how we diagnose TB in much of the world. A patient spits into a cup, a lab technician stains the slide, a lab technician then looks under a microscope and tries to look for these same organisms that Robert Koch saw in the 1850s. So after 150 years, really not much progress in the way that we diagnose TB. And the reason is because really we use microscopy because it's, it's very fast. It takes about two minutes to make a slide and to look for TB under it. It's also very cheap. It costs less than a dollar a test and it's simple. It doesn't require any sophisticated equipment. But the problem is that microscopy is not very accurate. It misses about one out of every two cases of TB. So half of the people with TB don't have a positive microscopy result. It also doesn't identify drug resistance because TB that is sensitive to drugs and resistant to drugs looks the same under a microscope. So in the US, in addition to microscopy, we do culture, which means that we take a sputum specimen and plate it on a Petri dish and wait for the TB bacilli to grow. Now, this is very accurate. Right? It's, it's actually the most accurate test that we have for TB. But it also, and it also identifies drug resistant strains of TB. But the main problem with this test is that it requires expensive biosafety infrastructure. I already mentioned that TB is highly infectious, right? So when you're growing TB and growing it in large quantities, it exposes healthcare workers to a risk of acquiring the infection. So these are done in sort of biosafety level three facilities, which as you can imagine are very uncommon in the developing world. More recent tests like PCR are also very effective. They're highly accurate and they're rapid. They're providing results in one to two hours. But these have some limitations, right? They're not that simple to do. They require a little bit of sophisticated laboratory infrastructure and trained laboratory technicians. They also are moderately expensive, costing about $10 to $50 per test. And they can identify sort of a resistance to a single drug or, or a single mutation that causes drug resistance, but they're not very effective. The current platforms are not effective at identifying all of the different mutations that cause resistance to the various drugs we, uh, we use to treat TB. So we're still looking for an ideal test, one that's accurate, it's fast, it provides results to clinicians right away. It's simple to do so that it can be done in, done in any lab or in any clinic in the developing world. It's inexpensive so that its reach is far. And then it can identify which drugs the patient's uh, disease is sensitive to. So not that we just start any treatment, but that we start effective treatment for the patient. So to address this problem, we're bringing together scientists from three leading institutions in California, the Berkeley Lab, the UCSF School of Medicine, and here at UC Berkeley. So we're going through a process where we're assembling technologies and expertise at each of these institutions to figure out how to address this problem of TB diagnosis. So the first piece of this solution is, is based on a technology called microfluidics, which deals with the behavior and control of fluids in very small spaces. And by small, I mean really small, sub-millimeter spaces. So a technology uh, was developed here um, at, the Berkeley Lab, or by, at UC Berkeley by Professor Luke Lee, which takes a sputum sample that's in a cup, a reagent is added to that sputum sample to decrease its viscosity, and then the sample is loaded onto a microfluidic chip. And what this chip does is it contains thousands of little channels or tubes, and, that, and it, delivers the sputum, it delivers the sputum sample to, say, a DNA detection platform, and the, and the tube is coated with reagents, which extract DNA from the cells inside the sputum sample, and then deliver that DNA to sort of a detection platform that I'll tell you about in a little bit. The next step that we're gonna take is take advantage of advances in genomics. This is, what, what's pictured here is the entire genetic sequence of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the organism that causes TB. This was first discovered or first reported in 1998. At our lab at UCSF, we've now sequenced hundreds of TB isolates from, uh, from clinical isolates that were collected from patients enrolled in studies around the world. So what this allows us to do is to compare the genetic sequence of all the TB strains that we have 
to find targets that are common across all the different strains in the world. And then we can also compare these strains, um, the sequences of, sequences of all other organisms, right? So we can really identify genetic targets that are specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis and then are present across every TB strain. We can also then take drug sensitive and drug resistant strains and compare their gene sequences. And then we can figure out what are the mutations that cause resistance to all of the key anti-tuberculosis drugs. So the next step, once we have targets to go after, is then to develop a platform for detecting those targets. And for that, we're gonna take advantage of a technology developed at the Berkeley Lab, by, initially by Professor Gary Anderson. So what it is, is this little chip. It's a disposable plastic chip that I can keep in my pocket and hold in my hand. And what this chip contains is up to millions of features. And each feature contains millions of probes. And those probes contain, those probes, what they do is they go and find genetic targets, DNA targets. So this thing was initially designed to find um, for applications that require simultaneously detecting hundreds of, or sorry, millions of different um, genetic targets. We're not interested in that many. There are probably about 100 or so genetic targets we need to identify in order to figure out whether someone has TB and whether they have TB that's resistant to one of several drugs that we use to treat TB. So what we do is uh, led by uh, uh, a team of scientists both at the Berkeley Lab and at UCSF, Drs. Owen Brody, Susan Lynch, and Ulas Karoz. What they're doing is they're gonna take all the genetic targets that we identify through our detailed genetic analysis of TB strains and load those targets onto this chip. So that just with this little, little, this little device, this little disposable device can contain all of the genetic targets we need to diagnose TB. The other advantage of this chip is that once it's designed, it's very inexpensive to manufacture. Right? For every target, it just costs pennies um, to place onto this chip. So for about 100 targets, a chip with 100 targets can be manufactured for just a few dollars. And the last technology we're gonna take advantage of is called cell scope. Right? So once we have all of these PCR reactions happening on this chip to identify genetic targets, we need a way to, to, to read and interpret those results, like which ones are positive, which ones are finding the targets. Right now, that takes expensive equipment and sensors to do that. But instead, we're gonna take advantage of a technology that Dr. Fletcher developed here at UC Berkeley. And what this is, is a cell phone, right? It uses a cell, it uses a cell phone and, computer, and the, and the uh, computing power of a, a typical smartphone, the camera and the computing power of a smartphone, and connects that to an optical chamber to process light signals. So what's shown here is a simple microscope. You have mirrors and lenses which, put, which draw light to the camera of a smartphone, and this now is just a simple microscope, simple and inexpensive microscope that functions as well as some of the expensive microscopes that are in many labs today. Dr. Fletcher and his team have also shown that this device can be used to process the light signal from a PCR reaction, which is what we use to identify DNA targets. So what we need to do now is to develop this technology further to be able to simultaneously detect and process the signals from the hundreds of PCR reactions that will be developed onto this chip. But what this does is provides a very inexpensive and portable platform for us to be able to detect the PCR reactions occurring on our TB chip. So this is what we hope it'll look like. A doctor collects a sputum sample from a patient. A simple reagent is added to decrease the viscosity of the specimen. The specimen is loaded onto a chip which delivers, extracts and delivers the DNA to this little microchip. And the microchip is placed into a simple reader based on a smartphone, right? And then within an hour, a doctor and a patient knows whether he, has he or she has tuberculosis and whether that tuberculosis is resistant to key drugs. So these are the types of technologies and innovations we hope to bring to this problem of tuberculosis to find a diagnostic that can really help any patient in the world know whether they have TB and to start effective treatment right away. Thank you. We have the chip. So this chip, this chip, it's got this tiny space here. It can identify, if you put water in it, it can identify one of 8,000 bacteria. Now, if you fall sick in a developing country, you have, you have fever, you have no idea what's wrong with you. Do you have malaria, do you have TB, something else, unclear. And while you, you're waiting to find out, you could die. Can we take this and repurpose it so that with a single test, you can actually figure out which one of those diseases you have? So you've seen a sample of the kinds of things we can do we're hoping to do. Um, this is the world's largest repository of, of science like this. We have our work cut out for us. So thank you.